Welcome to the Atlas 2021 Year in Review. We obviously skipped last year, so this year I'll try to cover two years worth of themes and what a crazy couple years it's been. As in the past, we're gonna cover three things here with the Year in Review. A deep dive on the macro, a review of the biotech ecosystem, and then a quick update on Atlas Venture. Starting with the macro context, it's fair to say that COVID has had a massive impact crater on society, science, and the sector. Let's walk through each of those in turn. In terms of society, society has been marked by enormous human suffering over the last 18 months. COVID cases and COVID deaths in charts like this for the globe and the United States are ones we're all too familiar with. Things are getting better, but there are still 1,500 deaths in the United States every day. This is far too much. In many ways, we become desensitized to this loss of life. To put this tragedy in some perspective, it's worth comparing to the great wars that shaped society. More people have died in COVID than in the greatest generation of World War II or the brothers and sisters who died in the Civil War. And like these conflicts, we should expect to have huge multi-generational impacts on society. This is perhaps the COVID generation. It has changed the language. It has changed our lives. Phrases like flatten the curve, social distancing, quarantine, lockdowns. These are all too common in our language today. We've all become armchair immunologists. The flu pandemic of 1918, like COVID, ripped through society with multiple waves. But one of the most striking parallels to me is that no town was left unscathed. Right after quarantine started and lockdown started in March of 2020, I took a jog in a small town up in New Hampshire called North Woodstock, ran by a cemetery and Waterman Russell's grave jumped out at me. 47 year old scientist, born on my birthday and died in the second wave of the Spanish flu. Think about a hundred years from now when folks are walking by three quarters of a million graves across the United States and thinking about COVID. Another historic parallel is of course with polio. The great polio epidemic of 1950 to 1953 raised fear and awareness and drove a massive vaccination program. Here's Elvis getting his shot. My mom was a school teacher in the early 60s and actually handed out sugar cubes in her classroom to students to give them a polio vaccination. And yet in that great crisis of the early 50s, only 7,000 people died of polio. About 25,000 were paralyzed. COVID has killed a hundred times more than this, and yet a quarter of the population in America remains or expresses anti-vax sentiments. It's really mind-blowing, but science is winning. As Pfizer said in March of 2020, science will win, and indeed we are well on our way. It's too early to declare mission accomplished, but the end game is in sight and involves a few things. First, virulent coronaviruses are here to stay. They will be endemic. Because of that, herd immunity is unlikely. We are going to continue to see infections, especially in high-risk groups, and we'll likely have annual vaccination programs for those folks. We also need to prevent the preventable death, the unnecessary deaths, through better care, better precautions. Hybrid models of work and home and how we interact are going to be here to stay to manage things like this virus. And lastly, we need to follow the science and medicine for how we diagnose, treat, and prevent COVID infections in the future. So that's a great segue into how science responded to this crisis. Over the last 18 months, we've seen hundreds of clinical trials addressing COVID and its sequelae around the world get started every month. We've learned a lot from these trials. In particular, we've learned about the true heroes of COVID, which are the vaccines. Here on the left is a snapshot of the Pfizer-BioNTech curves in the New England Journal of Medicine, showing massive reductions in infections, hospitalizations, and death, like a number of other vaccines. We've seen almost 7 billion doses administered around the world in what has been the most rapid and likely safest vaccine rollout in the history of humanity. Nearly 300,000 lives have been saved in the United States alone 
because of vaccines. A number of different kinds of vaccines, but the mRNA technology, a relatively new technology, has been a star. And it's been a star developed at lightning speed. When you compare to the past, it took years, if not decades, to develop a vaccine. 11 months from virus sequence to approval. Staggeringly fast for a new technology. But this was a multi-decade overnight success. mRNA, the first time it was expressed in vitro and turned into protein, was over 50 years ago. 25 years ago, we were injecting mRNA into animal models, looking at immune responses and thinking about vaccines. And in 2009, the first human trial using mRNA for a cancer vaccine was put into place. I say all this because the technology was poised to jump in and save us in this pandemic, and indeed it did. Important to remember, science always builds on the shoulders of giants. Behind the vaccines, we've seen hundreds of therapeutics and therapeutic attempts put forward to address different kinds of COVID. Unfortunately, only a few drugs have really shown profound benefit, be it steroids, monoclonal antibodies, or a few direct acting antivirals like remdesivir or more recently, molnupiravir. But that's not for lack of trying. There has been a huge number of very sound scientific hypotheses that have tested and failed, in particular around anti-inflammatory approaches to suppress that bad part of the immune response, or convalescent plasma, largely failed. We've also seen pseudoscience fail to deliver in real clinical trials, cult-like followings of hydroxychloroquine or ivermectin. Indeed, even in pandemics, gold standard randomized controlled studies are smart, they're good science and smart medicine. That's been a major takeaway from our response to this pandemic. There are at least four other learnings that I'd like to walk through. One is that indeed we are in the decade of immunology. This chart was shown in 2016, highlighting the role of the immune system touching other organ systems. And indeed, our understanding of this virus and the questions it's raised has brought this to a fore. Whether it's understanding how B cells and how durable B cell antibody production will be, or how to suppress that toxic part of the immune response in the heart, in the lung, the clotting that's been occurring, the brain fog, or even this concept of the long COVID syndromes that many patients are suffering with. This highlights how the virus has really emphasized the need for us to learn much more about the immune system and how it's interconnected with other organ systems. Second key learning has been around the pandemic, the pandemic response and preparedness. Time Magazine had a prescient cover in 2017 saying we weren't ready and indeed we weren't. We didn't have medicines stockpiled and invested in for likely causes of outbreaks. We didn't have diagnostics for surveillance and monitoring. Medical equipment, the proper uh, stores of PP, PPE and other things, nor a public health infrastructure that was ready to be deployed in the case of a pandemic. Whether that pandemic be caused by natural causes, man-made viruses, as scary as that sounds, or drug-resistant infections. We need to be ready next time. The third has been around creative collaborations have allowed us to solve some of the problems during COVID. Public-private partnerships like Operation Warp Speed, CARE in Europe, or the FDA CTAP program brought public resources and public commitment with private ingenuity to solve some of these great challenges. We've also seen private consortia, the R&D COVID Alliance, bringing together folks for clinical trials, or the industry testing consortia, to help us crack the back of the diagnostics challenge. All of these creative collaborations, there are lessons in here about how we can tackle other problems facing society in the sector. The fourth key learning has been that R&D can indeed be very fast. Taking vaccines aside, which we already talked about, it can even be done in more conventional therapeutics like antibodies. Antibodies typically go through a gauntlet of tests in discovery and preclinical, often taking five years to get into the clinic and another set in clinical trials. But over the past 12 months, we've seen five antibodies get approved in three different products 
enormously fast. Imagine if we could do anything like that speed for anti-cancer antibodies. It would reshape the sector. In fact, that's a good segue into how the sector has responded to COVID. I'd say the word resilience is a great definition for how we've reacted. The capacity to stay focused on making new medicines for patients in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. In the first six months of the pandemic, over 1,200 clinical trials were impacted across nearly every disease area. Of these impacted trials, two thirds were significantly disrupted and delayed. One out of 10 were shut down. And most of these were phase two and three trials, bringing new medicines close to patients, if not close to the market. The silver lining in all of this is of course, the industry is rethinking site-based in-person models with more digital and virtual studies. Despite this early disruption, things largely came back on track and things really stayed on track between how the FDA and the industry worked together for new drug approvals. Seven of the last eight years, we have seen above average approvals of new medicines. 2020 and 2021 were no different despite COVID. In 2020, we saw precision oncology, new drugs for autoimmune disease, several ADCs, even a triple antibody cocktail for Ebola. And in 2021, continuing that theme of innovation, we saw the first bispecific for lung cancer, antibodies for cardiovascular disease, even drugging KRASC, that incredibly undruggable cancer target. There is so much in here for our sector to be enormously proud of the drugs we've been able to get approved over the last couple of years. Beyond just new approvals, we've also extended the use of existing drugs to important new indications. In heart failure, SGLT2s, in obesity, the GLPs, incredibly compelling clinical data helping those patients with the enormous burden of cardiometabolic disease. In the autoimmune space, similar. Dupi has been extended into EOE and Ozanamod in ulcerative colitis. Lots to be proud of about how we take existing medicines into broader indications. But not everything with the FDA industry interaction has been without controversy. Last year, we saw the approval of Aduhelm, the first beta amyloid antibody drug approved for Alzheimer's. There are clear positives with this. It gives hope to folks with this enormously burdensome disease with massive unmet needs and no real therapies. It also got approved with an accelerated path using biomarkers, perhaps opening doors to other biomarker approvals in neurodegenerative diseases. And it may make neuroscience great again for the investment community to put more capital into the space with the hopes of bringing drugs into the Alzheimer's pipeline. But there are also some real negatives. The reality is Aduhelm failed to show convincing and compelling clinical data that it improved the lives of patients and failed two large trials for futility. Adding insult to injury, pricing it at $56,000 a year is just egregious for a drug that isn't proven to work. This has created, I think, a very bad precedent for the industry around the FDA and payer disconnect. In the past, the FDA approves a drug and the healthcare system helps deliver it to patients. Today, we're seeing providers and payers put up obstacles to the use of an FDA approved product. Long story short, I'm hopeful that this approval will bring more funds into the overall industry pipeline for this dreaded disease. Speaking of the industry pipeline, here are six of the most exciting things that our firm thinks are in the clinic uh, today in terms of uh, late stage clinical development. TIC2, the allosteric mechanism, broadly in autoimmune, but in particular in psoriasis, BMS has published some great phase three data, and we're super excited about this target with our program at Nimbus. In obesity, the GIP-GLIP duels have very compelling data in this really important healthcare burden. Another allosteric approach, this time against ABLE for CML from Novartis, highlighting the power of allosteric for delivering differentiated medicines, something we're excited about at Hotspot Therapeutics. In multiple myeloma, we've seen the extension of bispecifics into that arena with some very compelling data from Johnson & Johnson. In urticaria, taking a 
common cancer target, CKIT, and thinking about how you can address mast cells in urticaria, Celdex showed very nice proof of principle data that indeed that can deliver benefits and is something that we're excited about at Third Harmonic. In the world of ADCs and radioligands, continued march of compelling evidence in this particular case, Novartis with its prostate cancer radioligand. Very nice later stage data showing the importance of ADCs and radioligands as a modality of the future. Things that we're excited about at Magenta and Curie Therapeutics. Beyond these six, there's been a host of other exciting programs, including four from our own portfolio that I'd like to highlight. In NASH, liver disease, our FGF21 program at Akiro. In cancer, the oncolytic viruses that Replimune is developing. Abrobio developing its Lenti gene therapy for Fabry and Gaucher and other lysosomal storage diseases. And last but not least, Intellia showing the first time in vivo CRISPR gene editing having a real impact for patients, in this case, in TTR. Lots to be super excited about as both an industry and a firm. Rolling up to the industry level, there are over 5,000 clinical stage programs today, burning around $180 billion in aggregate R&D capital. What's been the driver of this growth since it's almost doubled as an industry pipeline in the last 10 years? A big part of that has been in cancer. Cancer has grown the fastest of all the various disease areas, pegging out at a 9% CAGR over that period of time, highlighting some of the advancements in areas like immuno-oncology or precision oncology. If you take a look at the modality cut behind this data, you can see that conventional pills have grown slowly, but the real growth driver is in cell and gene therapies, here at 14, growing at 14% annually. We now have nearly 1,000 preclinical and clinical programs in the cell and gene therapy space, 1,200 clinical trials, and over $20 billion has been spent supporting their development. This space is very crowded, very, very competitive, but enormously compelling to patients in terms of having real impact. Not everything is easy, and that holds for cell and gene therapy as well. Highlighting a few of the R&D is hard challenges uh, and failures that we've had as a sector. We've seen some durability questions in AAV, in particular in hemophilia. We saw a couple AAV blindness programs get terminated from the Nightstar programs at Biogen. Other new modalities like microbiome stumbling in ulcerative colitis or ASOs in diseases like Huntington's and ALS. Super disappointments this year for those patient communities. But it's not just new modalities that have hit challenges in R&D as always happens, small molecules as well. I highlight autotaxin, a very widely sought after target in fibrosis, really failing to deliver benefit in lung fibrosis for Gilead. All of this goes to say R&D is hard. There really is no low hanging fruit, regardless of what modality you're going after. Science is incredibly risky, but it's not the only risk affecting our sector. There are at least five policy risks, pricing, regulatory, FTC, IP, and fiscal issues. Talking about drug pricing, it's back on center stage in Washington, D.C. under the guise of helping consumers the recycling of bad old ideas. Be these drug pricing caps, reference pricing, drug importation, or Medicare monopsony. The problem with finding the wrong solution is because you haven't defined the right problem. There are three major problems that need healthcare payment reform. The first is out-of-pocket costs. A half a trillion dollars will be spent by consumers out of pocket for healthcare. This is an insurance failure that needs to be addressed. The second is the baffling complexity of the US healthcare system and the role of rebates. This separation between gross list prices, which have grown at single digit percentages over the last five years, and net prices back to manufacturers that have been shrinking for the last five years. So where does that delta go? It goes to the inefficiencies of the US healthcare system that incentivize higher list prices so that middlemen can make their returns. This needs to be addressed. The third is, of course, biosimilars. Biosimilars offer huge potential to fulfill the social contract we have. 200 billion in biosimilar sales today, 50% of which should come under competition from biosimilars over the next few years. 
Importantly, we saw our first interchangeable biosimilar get approved in July in insulin and a second one for Humira in October. If executed well and priced at biogeneric levels, this could create enormous healthcare savings for us as we advance and deliver on that social contract that is so important. Second major risk is around regulatory. Is the FDA a thoughtful regulator or have they been moving the goalposts? After a whole host of rejection letters, CRLs, earlier this year, this question was being asked of, is the FDA becoming too tough? I personally fall on the side of a thoughtful regulator. I think many of the rejections objectively had issues, but importantly, the FDA as a whole has been incredibly facilitating and engaged with innovators to bring new medicines forward. I do see two risks with the FDA though. One is around permanent leadership. I am hopeful that Dr. Califf comes in and can provide that multi-year long-term strategic leadership that the FDA needs to set its overall agenda and embrace innovation. And then secondly, something that both the FDA and the industry needs to worry about is the revolving door and intimate coziness between a regulator and the industry it's supposed to regulate. The last three are all reasonably far-fetched but could be high impact. Imagine waking up to a headline that says the FTC has banned all pharma and biotech M&A, or that the government's exercising margin rights on patents, or that inflation is soaring above 10%. These aren't actually that far-fetched. The FTC has a panel addressing the value of M&A in the sector. Patents were definitely questioned during COVID. And fiscal, monetary, and tax policy could unfavorably combust, creating a massive inflation environment. All three of these confront the reality of our sector, which is that M&A is a crucial and critical part of the health of our ecosystem, recycling capital, talent, and ideas, Patents are essential for rewarding risk takers and innovators. And lastly, long dated R&D heavy loss making industries need access to efficient and effective cost of capital. All five of these pose the policy risks that our sector needs to address. But it's not the only risk that society needs to think about, which is of course, when do we get back to normal and what does that new normal look like? I am hopeful that science will lead us out of this pandemic as it has for the last year or so. So that's a wrap on the macro context. And with that, let's shift to a dive into the biotech ecosystem. I'm gonna walk through an overview, a little bit around the venture capital cycle, and then highlight four of the major challenges. The past year in the public equity markets um, around biotech has been reasonably choppy. If you take a look at the XBI index shown here in gold, represents a bias towards small and mid-cap biotech companies. We're down about 10% and it's been choppy for the last nine months. The NBI bias to more larger biotechs is up a few percentage points. But needless to say, it's been a challenging overall market environment. And yet, if you look at that white line, it has been an enormous year for the equity capital markets, raising capital in venture, IPOs, and follow-ons, we are likely north of 60 billion this year, making it the biggest year of all time. It's choppy market like this that make you think about market sentiment. Market sentiment is fundamentally a first derivative function. It looks at slope only in the near term. We've all heard it from bankers and pundits this year. The markets are fragile, they're softening, volatility is scary. Or my favorite quote from a banker, there's a lot of wood to chop to get this deal done. I think all of this may be true for the fickleness of the markets today, but it's super important as a sector that you step back and look at the 10-year view. Over the 10-year view, we are in a long-term secular bull market with enormous capital market depth and capital market access. The XBI was 25 10 years ago. It's gone up 500% since then. The last five to eight quarters, have been enormous when it comes to venture, IPO, and follow-on financings, the biggest period of funding that our sector has ever seen. It's important to have that long-term view, especially when you're in the venture capital business, which involves this long-term venture capital cycle. We start with venture creation, move to building and scaling, and then integrating talent, ideas, and capital 
into the companies we help fund and create. We look on the capital side and talk about the venture flows into private biotech. So the last five quarters have been five of the largest quarters of all time for venture capital funding. It used to be that a $100 million mega round was the unusual financing. Only a few companies ever achieved it. Well, this year, we've seen three $500 million financings. It's just an incredibly accommodating and open capital market for building and funding venture-backed biotech companies. So we move into the venture cycle and we talk about venture creation. It remains, interestingly, a relatively scarce startup environment. The gold bars there represent the funding that you just saw, but that white line is the number of first financings, a theme I have talked about in the past. It's only up modestly over the last 10 years, revealing this constraint on the ability to start companies. And what is that constraint? Fundamentally, that constraint is talent, not capital or ideas. As we move into building and scaling, the democratization of the access to cash has been an enormous force in the industry over the last couple of years. Here showing median venture funding per round is up two to threefold, at valuations that are up two to threefold. You can raise twice the amount of money with the same amount of dilution. This is a great environment to be raising capital in. What's true in the private markets is true in the public markets. We've seen public market balance sheets of biotech companies Today, the typical company has between 120 and $160 million on their balance sheet, up considerably from just a few years ago, depending on which cut of the data you look at. But this democratization of access to cash for private and public companies changes the nature of business development because it changes a company's calculus on taking equity dilution or taking asset dilution, partnering away your firstborn child. Here you can see the deals that are getting done are much more attractive to biotech companies than ever before. 1.5 to $3 billion of biobucks highlighted by these 10 deals around relatively early stage, but super compelling platforms and assets. The other discussion that happens in boardrooms beyond doing partnering deals is around what is the exit dynamic? Are we going to take this private company into the public markets or are we going to be acquired by a larger pharmaceutical company? In the recent quarters, it's fair to say that the vast majority of companies are choosing the public market path, either to go on to independence or to turn the card on more data before the possibility of an outright acquisition. But the M&A market has been incredibly tepid. If we look at one cut of the data, which is public and private R&D stage M&A events, you can see that this year is likely the smallest of the last five. We've seen some activity here highlighting eight interesting private and public deals. I'll call attention to Translate and Sanofi. We had the uh, privilege of helping co-found Translate 10 years ago, so quite excited about that one. But a large number of other deals in this category. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the Acceleron deal, really a landmark transaction, $11 billion. They're not here because they have a marketed product, but it's deals like this and the ones on this slide that help recycle that capital into the investor's pocket so that they can redeploy it into earlier stage emerging biotech stories and support the IPO environment. Shifting to the IPO environment, the last two years have been some of the most prolific of all time. We're running at seven or eight IPOs per month on average for the last seven or eight quarters, matching any period of activity in the IPO markets. I think it's important to think about the resilience of the IPO window 45 straight quarters of offerings. This is vastly different than the first three decades of biotech with its feast and famine model of um, IPO windows. This is a 10 year window that's been open. And today terms like oversubscribed, upsized, above the range pricing, these are very common in a lot of IPOs today. And we are likely in 2021 to have a record breaking year for the amount of funding into biotech companies via IPO. And this funding has happened at great valuations and with significant size increases. If you look at the pre-money valuations of IPOs, they're up threefold over the last few years. The amount being raised is up two to threefold. So a great time to raise capital in the public markets and earlier and earlier stage companies are accessing it. Five out of six companies that went public 
in the last seven or eight quarters did not have human proof of concept data. They were either in phase one or importantly were in preclinical development. So innovation is hot, even if frankly aftermarket performance has not. 45% of companies in the current cohort are trading above their IPO price and probably two thirds of this cohort have broken their issue price at some point post their initial public offerings. This is slightly worse than where we were with the 2020 class. Roughly 60% are above their IPO prices today, which is a more typical distribution this close to following an initial public offering. But you'll note that seven or eight of these companies have had over 200% increases in their stock price since IPO, marking some of the upsides you can have by participating in this environment. But the IPO isn't the only path to the public markets today. SPACs really took the sector by storm over the last 18 months or so. We've seen 36 SPAC IPOs raising money to go and acquire private biotech companies with the promise of faster timelines, less dilution, less pricing risk. Here's a list of six exemplary SPACs. Note, great SPAC sponsors. These are blue chip public equity and crossover investors that you'd wanna work with. The size of many of these SPACs is significantly higher from the perspective of capitalizing companies. But importantly, the dispersion is largely the same. Some outperform and some significantly underperform, just like the dispersion we see in IPOs. I think it remains to be seen whether SPACs will be an instrument in the capital markets toolkit for companies or whether this will be a flash in the pan. The final thing I'd like to mention around the venture capital cycle is around the speed of the cycle. It has never been as fast as we've seen today. Take a look at when the window really opened it back in 2013. The typical IPO candidate was about 10 years old from founding to IPO. Today, that number is only four years. Over that period of time, the typical M&A has hovered around seven plus years. This dichotomy is because of the increasing attractiveness of earlier and earlier stage companies into the public markets. And once you get crossover investors looking on the right, the speed with which those companies end up getting pulled into the public markets has never been faster. It used to be 10 or 12 months post a crossover. Today, that number is less than five months. And so the pace with which we can scale young companies into the public markets and access significant amounts of capital to build their portfolios has never before been seen in our sector. That all sounds great, but there are at least four challenges that our sector potentially faces. One around crowds, burn rates, talent, and potentially an overabundance of capital. On the crowd side, you just look at the number of biotechs that are trading on the two major indices in the United States. It has tripled over the last 10 years, north of 650 or so companies today. This far outstrips the capacity of the core blue chip investors to put in major positions into those companies. Almost all of these biotechs will need to be raising multiple rounds of follow-on financing in the capital markets. And having a position with a large blue chip investor, deep pocket investor to support you is really a coveted prize in our space. This is the relevancy challenge to all emerging biotech companies today. How do I be important to a relatively small group of blue chip investors? The second challenge is around managing our burn rates because burn rates have to be fed. Five years ago, loss-making biotech burned 14, $15 billion. Today, four times that, almost $60 billion of equity cash will be burnt in 2021. We see over 100 companies burning 100 million a year, 30 companies burning 200 million a year. These are staggering burn rates that involve significant headcounts, significant space footprints, lots of ongoing fixed costs that should hiccups happen or should the markets cool could be very disruptive to the sector. We have to be mindful of some of these burn rates. The third is around talent, a crucial challenge for our industry, really the lifeblood of our sector. We are seeing one out of every six employees turnover in our space. 70% of those that are leaving are leaving before their third anniversary. 
these job hoppers are getting promotions and salary increases that entice them out of their roles before the ink is even dry. 85% of companies are either aggressively hiring or hiring at pace, suggesting this is a broad-based phenomenon that really has not abated during COVID at all. If anything, it's only intensified over the last couple of years. We're seeing the convergence of private compensation packages into the public markets, where highly sought after candidates are getting effectively public cash compensation and private stock compensation. This is creating significant inflationary pressure in the acquisition of talent for our companies. The last potential uh, challenge for the sector is around, is there too much capital? Looking at venture capital funds and how much they have raised from LPs, it's going to top $30 billion this year. That is a huge amount of capital relative to where we were 10 years ago. In fact, 10 times more. It's uh, a long way since I wrote one of my earliest blog pieces on how the life sciences gets no respect from the LP community. Now, the good news of raising $30 billion a couple years in a row is that the dry powder overhang embedded in those funds likely means that deployment of capital into biotech companies over the next few years will be quite strong. But there is a question of how much is too much funding for our space and will it diminish overall returns? Thankfully, at least for top quartile players, that has not been the case in the last few years. So from Cambridge Associates, if you compare public market equivalent returns of the XBI biotech index or the Russell 2000, you can see that they outperform the median. The median in venture and frankly, the median in almost any asset class is always below their market indices. But the top quartile venture players are beating their indices by 1,000 to 1,500 basis points of outperformance. That's significant outperformance and I think bodes well for continued LP interest in the space and in biotech venture capital as a whole. We've appreciated the support of our own LPs here at Atlas, and that's a great segue into a quick update on Atlas Venture. I'm gonna walk through our strategy, portfolio, and team here in the next couple minutes. On the strategy side, for those not familiar with Atlas, we've stuck to our knitting. We're a seed-led venture firm working on therapeutics, an early stage focus, really science-first investors. We source science globally, and generally we build it locally with this mantra of doing well by doing good. Our science first portfolio at Atlas spans both every disease area and every modality. We are agnostic to disease and modality. Across 40 or so portfolio companies, we have nearly 160 active R&D programs across all of those different areas. It looks a lot like a mid-sized pharma company. Here was our pipeline in 2016. If you advance five years, you can see a significant number of those programs have moved into clinical development. We now have over 50 active clinical programs in our portfolio. In terms of supporting that portfolio with financings, we've had an incredibly busy um, last seven quarters. We've funded or started 21 young companies. Atlas itself has deployed almost a half a billion dollars into our portfolio. Friends in the industry, syndicate partners, put in another two and a half to three billion. We've had 14 IPOs and M&A events and delivered gross proceeds of roughly a half a billion dollars. Our current aggregate portfolio is worth 4.3 billion on a cost basis of around 1.2 billion. Times have been great at Atlas and it's been a super exciting environment for building, financing young companies. But the most exciting part is around the exciting new medicines that we're developing behind these. I mentioned four clinical stage programs before, but here are some more. Chimera with its IRAC-4 program, Day One in glioma, Surface with IL-27, Synlogic with its synthetic biotics in PKU, Zilio around IL-2 immunotherapy, and Dyne working in muscular dystrophy. These are all super exciting programs and just a small selection of the truly compelling programs our portfolio is advancing. These kinds of programs have allowed us to do a lot of partnerships with pharma. Here's a set of those partnerships over the last handful of months. Vertex actually did two cell and gene deals with us at Affinia and Obsidian. Sanofi partnered with us at Chimera on our IRAC4 immunology program. 
Bicycle and SynLogic took their new modalities and partnered with Ionis and Roche for programs there. And Accent actually delivered two partnerships for its epitranscriptomic approaches with AZ and Ibsen. These business development deals are super important, but so are, of course, our financing environment, our financings. And we've had eight IPOs over the last seven quarters, with Zilio pricing most recently in mid-October. Raising in aggregate these eight have raised $1.5 billion to support the advancement of their overall programs. Really, really exciting time for these companies and for Atlas. Another piece of excitement has been Michael Gladstone joining the general partnership a little over a year and a half ago. Michael, after eight years of working with us, entered what is a six-person flat and equal partnership. Thrilled to have him, and it's a real privilege to work with this investment team. Six partners supported by just a fantastic group of uh, investment professionals, including two new venture partners, both Jody and Raj, helping us build and scale young, new biotech companies. But we wouldn't be successful as an investment team without a fantastic finance and ops team led by Omar Chohan, our CFO, across finance, IR, seed operations, and talent, that ever critical function. So thank you to this whole team, and again, a true privilege to work with them. Lastly, Atlas has a new office and uh, several new funds. The new office is at 300 Tech Square. We haven't spent a lot of time there as a firm given, uh, given COVID, but we're ramping up our activities and encourage anyone to come by and visit. We're actively deploying Fund 12. Just recently raised Opportunity Fund 2, and we'll be deploying that to help us scale our existing portfolio. And we contemplate raising our next early stage fund over the next six to nine months. The substrate for science gets us incredibly excited about the potential of the portfolio and about the next generation of young startups that are gonna take the science from bench to bedside for patients. Thank you for your time and attention to this year's 2021 Atlas Year in Review.